This video is on dynamic or growable or resizable arrays, also known as array lists in Java or vectors in C++. It's part of a playlist linked here. To understand array lists, first you have to know how arrays work. We build array lists using arrays, analyze them, go over their operations, and finish with a playlist including advanced optimization issues. So an array is something that holds a fixed number of elements. For notation, an array has some variable name and then has an index position inside of some square brackets. So this would be the fourth position within the array. Some languages use the same notation but allow you to index by anything like a string, but I'm not talking about that. I don't know what the freaking cat position of an array is. A real array is implemented as a continuous block of computer memory. You could start numbering at 1, but for this video I start at 0. So an array of size 8 has items indexed from 0 to 7. No fancy schmancy number skipping. We can store whatever we like in the array, but the size of each item is the same. So we can have an array of integers or characters or object references or even fixed size objects. Some of that's language dependent, but abstractly just imagine a bunch of items lined up in some fixed amount of memory that has been allocated to your program. So the great thing about arrays is that they give direct access to any location. Like any variable, the array name is associated with a memory location, and then the index just gives an offset from that location to a new memory location. If we want the fourth item, we just move forwards by four times the size of each item in the array. I'll use integers here, so we just move forwards to get the fourth integer after the one that starts the array. This is a very quick operation. Because arrays map directly to your computer memory, you need to specify how large the array will be when you allocate memory for it, which is their weakness. Sometimes you don't know how many spaces you need. If you don't allocate enough space, you'll run out of room, but if you allocate too much space, you waste memory. The big idea behind a dynamic array is that if you want to add something to an array that's already full, just allocate a big array, copy over all the items from the old array, and now you have space for more elements. Freaking genius, right? Now, it's really simple, but you need to do it the right way to get good performance. A bad way to go would be to just allocate exactly the space you know you need right now. So for my example, if I need room for the ninth element, I could copy over everything into an array with nine spaces. But later, if I want to add a tenth item, I would then need to move to an array of size 10. With this approach, I can really hose myself. To add the ith item takes time proportional to i, so if I add n total items, it takes order n squared time. A better way is to make the newer way array proportionally bigger than its current size, even if that's more than you immediately need. Starting with this size 10 array, when we run out of space, we could double the array size. So once you realize that you have an 11th item, and your array only has 10 spaces, you allocate a new size 20 array, copy over the first 10 items, and then add the 11th. We keep track of the fact that our data structure has size 11, but capacity 20. Now, there's still more room in the array, and if we want to insert a 12th item at the end of the data structure, just stick it there and increment the size. For this data structure, by default, always add new elements to the first unfilled location. We don't allow skipping, and if you add it to an earlier location, you have to shift items over to make room for it, and it kills your performance. While inserting only to the end is a bit of a limitation, the underlying array structure does let us directly access any item in constant time. If the size is less than our capacity, we can also add or delete from the end of the list in constant time too. Of course, if you really want to insert to somewhere in the middle of the array, you can, but it takes time proportional to the number of items after the position you're inserting to because we'll shift all of those items over to make room. Deletion from the middle also forces a shift to fill the blank space. Insertion and deletion from the middle of the array aren't really natural operations. They force us to loop over everything after the changed location. The array list class in Java has methods for indexed insertion or deletion, but it's internally implemented with a loop. They may have optimized that loop to try to make it fast, but you shouldn't forget it's there. The default position for insertion or deletion is the end of the list. Okay, what happens if we want to insert to the end, but the array is full? We can't just stick the item in place and increment the size anymore. Instead, we need to allocate new space, copy all of the items over, taking linear time in the total size. Can we fix that? Well, it turns out we don't need to. Because we double the array size when growing, those expensive insertions can't happen very often. 
Inserting to the end is expensive when going from size 10 to 11, but then we get a whole bunch of constant time insertions all the way up to 20. Then we get another expensive insertion, twice as expensive as the previous one, but then we get cheap insertions all the way up to size 40. Some insertions are expensive, but on average they take constant time each. This is called amortized analysis. Instead of looking at the cost of each operation individually, we consider the total runtime for an entire sequence of operations and use this to get the average performance per operation. For this data structure, the average performance of inserting to the back of the list is constant time. You can look at the best case average performance per insertion or the worst case average performance or even the average case average performance, they're all constant time. How do we prove that insertion takes on average constant time per operation? Imagination and intents. No, going back to our half full array of capacity 20, imagine that every time we insert into the array, if we have space, we not only pay for insertion, but also prepay to copy two values to new locations sometime in the future. Including this extra imagined payment, insertion still takes constant time even if it's a few times larger than the real time insertion takes. Clearly, adding that extra time to my time analysis isn't going to let me undercount how much real time is used to insert items. When we go to insert the 21st item, we first allocate the new array, size 40, and copy over 20 items to it. But for the last 10 insertions I did, I've already included the cost of two copies each in my time analysis. In our analysis, we withdraw against our prepaid copy operations. We've already deposited enough to copy over all 20 items. The actual copying doesn't happen until now, but if I'm analyzing all the time spent from the beginning, we see that we've already accounted for the time of these copies during the last 10 insertions. For the 21st item, I only still need to pay for its insertion, and with it I'll also prepay for two copy operations for the next time the array grows. This is called the accounting method for amortized analysis. Your analysis overcharges for some operations and uses those prepaid overages to pay for expensive operations which may come later. As long as the analysis for any sequence from the start charges at least the real life amount, you can use it to get valid average upper bounds. Okay, how about deletion? If you want to delete from the end of the list, clearly you can do that in constant time, but is there any reason to shrink the size of the underlying array if it's too empty? Before figuring out how to do that, is it worth doing? It is. Imagine that we're simulating a set of a billion items moving around between a thousand lists. On average, the lists have a million items each, but occasionally, maybe most of the items end up being in one list. When that happens, the list size will grow to hold a billion items. If different lists are crowded at different times and you never shrink any of them, eventually you end up trying to allocate a thousand arrays of size a billion each, even though you only have a billion items. More generally, if you never shrink m lists holding n items total, can take order n m space instead of n plus m space. So when should we shrink the arrays? First of all, it depends on your growth factor. When you grow your arrays. We've been using growth factor 2, so you can't shrink them if they go just under half full, or you could end up with a bunch of expensive operations if you ever alternated between inserting and deleting right near a boundary, like between sizes 19 and 21 here. It would be slow. But if you double when growing, but only shrink when you go under, let's say, one quarter full, you'll be safe. Maybe you have some minimum size too. Using similar analysis to the insertion, where every deletion deletes one item from the end of the list, but we also prepay for a copy operation, we can prove that each deletion also takes a morsetized constant time. If we implement shrinking, array lists use only linear space in their size. Now that we know how array lists are implemented, it's easy to see what operations they give and also how to make an iterator for them. They support constant average time insertion and deletion from the last position, as well as constant time indexed item retrieval. Because of that quick retrieval, to make an iterator, the only information you need to store is an index, but the iterator shouldn't really be used to mess around with the middle of the list by inserting or deleting there. 
If you want to get into boss level topics like how to optimize your ArrayList growth factor, I'll cover that in a separate video on the playlist, but that's it for this one. I've got to work on my pirate accent. ArrayList.